So first, uh, we have a closer look at the prediction methods that one can use to predict these um, uh, in silico libraries that one needs for the library free approach. And then we will look at some new of the new features in the current release and also uh, finally at the new features that will be added in the next post summer school release. So, but so first let's have a look at the uh, prediction method. So you um, already mentioned that uh, one very, very favorable method uh, is recurrent neural networks. And so one example is this deep mass prediction algorithm that we developed in the lab that is based on exactly um, LSTM recurrent neural networks. And uh, so this is um, a deep learning method that is probably um, best suited for these kind of predictions. You get actually the best uh, kind of um, performance in terms of for predictive accuracy, in terms of uh, spectral correlation between predicted and experimental spectra with these kind of deep learning approaches. But then there are also other approaches that, that one can use um, as an alternative. Uh, so for example, there's this so-called uh, MS2PIP approach, uh, which, which, which is very simple because you just say, okay, I, I don't consider uh, sequences of uh, different lengths simultaneously, but I sort my peptide sequences by length. So basically, and then you make one predictor for length seven, one predictor for length eight, one for length nine, and so on and so forth, basically. So that's basically um, kind of circumventing this problem that the RNN solves that you actually want to make predictions of um, like these sentences or peptide sequences with different lengths, basically. Right? So we kind of avoid this problem by um, sorting them by length and then make models per length, which of course has the problem that uh, if you have, they haven't seen peptide with a certain length in your training data, then you also cannot do predictions for that particular length. And so that's actually something that we don't do, but we, what we do do is uh, this third approach here, which is uh, like a window-based approach. And so here the idea is that uh, we make predictions not for the whole spectrum in one go, but we do it peak by peak or actually peak, peak pair by peak pair by going through the bonds in the peptide and then we put sequence windows around the bond that we make the prediction for and use this as a feature space so this and also like a fixed length feature space because we're using these fixed length windows and other properties of the peptide um, to make this prediction then we have like two versions um, of, of this so one is one was called winner so because it was it's window based and uses a neural network and it's easily retrainable so that that's where the name came from and um, so then one was actually using like a fully connected, uh, uh, so in some sense, deep neural network here as this uh, machine learning algorithm that learns on these windows, but you could also use now any other. So you, you're not required to use deep learning or neural networks for doing this because you again have a fixed length feature space uh, and you could use, why not XGBoost again? Because it was working so nicely for the feature uh, scoring in uh, in max one uh, in max DIA. so we use it here as well and that's then called so it's performing um just as well or better and that's called then x mass basically so that's from the x from xg boost um, and that that's what we will also see later again in in max quant so actually why why would one actually not use the deep mass since it's performing so well uh, because uh, so these methods here are faster so, I, so it's, it's always takes a little bit of time to train these deep learning models and also you need big data to train these deep learning models and if you go to conventional machine learning so this usually works with less uh, training examples you could do it on smaller data sets to do this and that also means you can adapt to your specific needs maybe you've done something very special to your data you use special labelings, modifications, you name it, or something like this, that's so no problem. You just train a new model with relatively little data and also with uh, so with not uh, so so big requirements for the um, for the computation. So that that's that's the idea why one would uh, use uh, simpler models um, that where the predictive performance a little maybe a little bit worse than the recurrent neural network or deep learning in general but you have other advantages uh, instead of this. And actually when we compare 
um, these different ways of predicting the in silico library. So either the deep learning, and we have like two versions of this. So one is ours, the deep mass algorithm. And then there's another similar algorithm called PROSIT. Uh, and we compare it to one of these simple algorithms and we uh, uh, measure the performance in terms of number of identifications that we get uh, when using either of these. Then we see that the number of identifications so either in terms of uh, genes or proteins, or in terms of peptides actually very similar between these different approaches, which is good because that should mean that we can actually use the simpler winner approach for um, going ahead with um, with doing the prediction. So that, that will actually be then also what is used in the on the fly prediction of the library, where you don't have to come in with the predicted library from outside in MaxQuan, but where Max one just does the library prediction on the fly. You just pr provide the faster file, and it does the it just like that creates a library based on any faster file you provide, which is of course uh, much more flexible because you're not stuck to like the uniprot uh, faster file basically of um, with all human sequences. Okay, so that was just uh, some uh, remarks about the machine learning that we're using for predicting spectra. And so now let's look at what actually um, are the new features that are implemented in the latest release. So we have uh, two for, version 242 that's out there for a while now. And let's just uh, see what are some new features. So, so one thing is like that the 4D peak detection, so the one that is used for of Pro data, uh, this actually has been rewritten to stream once to the data. So before it was actually accessing the data many times. <laughs> now one, sorry, now one needs only one data access, and it's actually much faster than it used to be because of that. So we can do precursor charge prediction, um, which uh, is also helpful for <laughs> for the identification. So that means for the precursors that are not. Um, Coming with an isotope pattern, we can basically, on based on other properties, we can make good guess what the charge of this precursor is. Then we can also um, obtain non-leading matches. So that's a little bit like in DDA, where you can get like uh, not only the leading PSM, but also non-leading PSM, PSMs, and we score them. So we can do something similar to this in EIA as well now. The spectral libraries that we predict, they are not just the Y and B ions, but they also include now the neutral losses of water and ammonia to this, and that actually boosted the uh, performance quite a bit uh, by putting this in. So you can do batch computing, which means you, if you have a very large data set, you can actually process parts of it uh, separately. So maybe on separate computers even or something like this, and then put the results together and then um, like make one final analysis where you get like the big quantification matrix over all of the samples, but like the heavy heavyweight computing can already done separately in batches. So it could even be done in batches of size one raw file as it comes out the machine. One could actually use it for this as well. Then we have quite some um, disk space reduction, which is a little bit related to the batch computing because so by default we, um, we um, we process data sets in batches of 10 raw files. And then once a batch of 10 raw files is done, we delete all intermediate results that are produced in this batch of 10 so that it doesn't accumulate to uh, give you like big, uh, a big data that you need to store basically until the end of MaxQuant uh, or until the end of the workflows reach in MaxQuant. So that's not the case anymore. So basically, while it's uh, finishing batches, it's always uh, deleting intermediate results and you don't have a big uh, chunk of uh, intermediate data that has to be stored at some point uh, on the disk. So that so these two things are related, basically. Then we have uh, support for Plex DIA. Um, so uh, we will see um, results of that li later. And we also have a site localization algorithm that kind of does the PTM localization score from DIA data. So, and um, then you basically get like the usual site table that you would also get from DDA, foster proteomics runs, for example, and you get exactly the same output now also for uh, for DIA data. 
So let's look in detail at some of these. So for example, here you see a benchmark in terms of number of identifications with the two, with the version that's already out there, the 242. And so this is now um, Orbitrap data. So there's a HeLa data set, just three replicates of uh, HeLa basically measured on q executive uh, HFX. And uh, then, so this is then, we analyze um, in the library free mode. So basically with the predicted human in silico library. So without generating um, uh, DDA runs or whatever to general, uh, generate a library. And then we have a certain number of protein identification and it says compared here to the number you would get in Diane. And you see that they're pretty close to each other. And then it depends a little bit on the settings that you're using in Max Quant, if you get more or less than, um, uh, than um, Diane in total. And uh, um, so the numbers actually what you find in all three replicates, um, um, uh, like in uh, the numbers that you find in all three repl replicates. So that's a little bit lower, but then the total number is a little bit higher for Max Quant high sensitivity setting. And uh, so that's pretty encouraging. So that so we um, basically there's in terms of numbers of proteins at least there's no not really big difference between um, the software. So unfortunately, we can it's not easy to do uh, benchmarks uh, against Spectronaut because we're not um, we're not that rich as a lab to uh, to own a license for Spectronaut. So that's uh, so that's the only reason why there's no benchmark against Spect. Otherwise, we would have of course loved to do a benchmark, but I would. My guess would be it's not also not that far. I guess these three are somehow very close to each other in terms of uh, uh, many of these um, kind of um, performance uh, numbers. So then we also did the benchmark on uh, Timsoft Pro, where so very similar. So that is from a recent paper where uh, Diane results were published for um, Timsoft together with Evosep and then um, you have these uh, three different uh, length of methods. So this is always like, so S SPD is actually not a German party, but it's like samples per day. So it's 200 samples per day or 100 or 60. So that kind of then defines what the length of the method is. And um, so yeah, it looks pretty good. So here, so like for the very short method, we actually get substantially more. Um, proteins identified and then it's re relatively similar or the same in the other two um, EvoSEP methods basically that, that were benchmarked here. So it's also here, it looks, looks pretty good and promising. Overlap between Diane and Max Quant is also not too bad, but they are, they are actually unique proteins to, um, to each of them. Which might be interesting to give to dig into what why is that exactly happening and if one would maybe combine I don't know maybe make it a bit closer and one could uh, even get a bigger number in total out of this somehow so that that's something we're looking into um, at the moment still so that, that's pretty interesting and um, well that, that's the numbers and that was label free so now let's have a look at uh, how does this Plex DIA in Max Quant uh, work actually? So what does it mean at all? So it means that you use uh, uh, labeling, so MS1 level labeling together with DIA. So that, that's all it means basically, right? So you could, for example, do Silec triplets, like medium heavy light in like one DIA sample. And so it's multiplexing. So instead of one sample measuring in one LCMS run, you measure now three samples in one LCMS run basically. And then you could also use it to have a carrier channel or you don't have a carrier channel. Um, so there are many choices you, you can do there. Uh, but in principle, it's just multiplexing with MS1 level labeling. And then again, there are different ways. So you can do this. You could do this with uh, Silec or with um, Amtrak or with Dimethyl or you name it. So basically any kind of uh, MS1 level labeling you could use for this. And um, so, we have now found four different algorithms that work together to identify these peptides uh, in different labeling states. So one of them is uh, the in silico spectral library matching. I mean, just as it was for label-free samples. Then of course, also here, we can use the transfer Q value. Uh, but it's actually used now in, in a different context because um, 
So you remember transfer view value that this was for for um, like uh, getting values for peptides that you would not have identified in this particular sample if you would be using the uh, stringent FDR settings, right? And then because you said, and because I've seen it already in another sample, I just take it here as well with the less stringent FDR threshold, right? And you can do the same, of course, with the multiplexed uh, DIA samples, but you can do it in uh, two different contexts because you can say, uh, I transfer within the same LCMS run between the different labeling states. So I might have identified the heavy one uh, with the proper Q value setting. And then you say, okay, then I allow the medium and light one because I've seen the heavy, I allow the medium and light one then with less stringent settings, right? So that would be transfer Q value within um, a, a LCMS run, but you could also use between LCMS runs, right? So that probably has two different statistical properties um, and will also be from next version be two, diff two separately specifiable thresholds if you match between or within uh, multiplex DIA ones. And then um, the th third one is then to transfer within complete MS1 multiplex um, instances. So basically as, as in DDA on the MS1 level, you could now um, say without any MSMS data that there are these three features belong together as one multiplayer, one silic multiplex with light, medium, heavy, basically, right? So basically independent of the fragment data, just looking at the MS1 data, you can conclude that like these three belong together in one multiplex, right? And then if one of them is identified by, um, by fragmentation, then you can transfer that to the other ones as well, right? So it's a bit different from transfer queue value because for transfer queue value, you still need fragment data. But here you do this only based on the MS1 data. This, this transfer of identifications, right? And then the fourth one is requantify. So that's, we saw already in DDA that you can also do here. So just to look at it in, in, de in detail again. So um, the first one was, um, yeah, so that fragment masses of spectral library are transferred to a labeling state. I mean, first of all, how do you analyze this with a library at all? So now you have multiple labeling states and your library, for example, could be label free. So, that, so that's no problem. So you don't have to have the library in also in multiplex form or in the same uh, labeling that you use for your DIA samples. So your library could be label free or it could be any other kind of labeling, it could even be TMT data or whatever. So all of this doesn't matter because, uh, so when Max Quant reads in the library, it doesn't actually read the actual mass values of the fragments that are you that are in the library. It only reads in the intensities and the annotation of peaks, and it recalculates them all of the masses, fragment masses, based on what the settings are for the DIA, right? And so in particular, it would then also let's in this example of si triple silic labeling it would then create for each peptide three versions, like that would create a light, the medium and the heavy version of a library spectrum that is then matched to the samples. <clears throat> and so, um, I mean, that's one way how you could do it, but you could also say, yeah, but I'm using a carrier channel. So in my light, let's say in my light state, there's like a higher signal than in the medium and heavy. And uh, then I could also say, yeah, but only, I only want to match the library to the carrier channel. And then the medium and heavy are either found by complete triplex or by requantified. So that that you could could also do basically. Yeah. So library can come from anywhere. So it could be in silico predicted libraries. It could be DDA measurements with any kind of non-fitting labeling, or it could also be exported from the DIA, DIA ones that you did before. Basically. So all of these um, options you have for that, right? And so it, it actually does require MS2 signals, right? Because that's how the library matching works basically. Uh, but MS1 signals are not mandatory here. So you can also identify peptides uh, when the precursor is not found. So that, that's also possible. And uh, so that was the first way of uh, doing this uh, multiplex DA analysis. Then already mentioned transfer Q value. So that means you still uh, require MS2 signals, 
but the Q value is basically reduced because we have already um, identified the peptide in other samples or in other labeling states. Yeah, so this is again the transfer within complete MS1 multiplexes. So that means, so based on the MS1 data, like the, um, like the um, multiplexing algorithm has found that these three MS1 isotope patterns belong to one silic triplex, right? So then what that means is then, let's say only the first one has been identified by fragment data, then we can still conclude that also this one here exists and this one here exists and we can use them for quantification, right? So that, that that's all it means basically, right? And so, yeah, so typically um, in terms of carrier channel that has a very high likelihood to be, to be uh, detected. And then this method would then transfer the identification to the other, to the, in this example, medium and heavy basically. And then the fourth option, so let's requantify. So that's that's actually different from, so it's also about MS1 signals, but it's different from the one we had here. Because so here we actually had the algorithm saying, just looking at the MS1 feature, these three isotope patterns belong together, right? And so that's the information we're using here. And so this information is missing in requantify. So in requantify, you have, for example, only identified the light, um, version of the triplex and you don't even have uh, isotope patterns or peak detection for the medium and heavy so they're, they're very low abundant basically so you couldn't like peaks were not seen it was not able to assemble isotope patterns for these and now we just transfer integration boundaries right so let's say we have identified like the light version of um or actually it's a heavy version of this particular peptide here with fragment data. And then we basically know where the uh, light version and the medium version are supposed to be. And we can just integrate the MS1 data for signals that are at exactly those places where the, uh, the non-detected partners are supposed to be. So basically it's independent of this multiplex um, identification also independent of that like the remaining states have been found with fragments it then so it's kind of probably the most sensitive uh, step in all of this so then basically you get the last out of the uh, um, out of the sample by doing this requantify and it's exactly the same algorithm as it's, as it's um, used uh, for DDAs even literally the same algorithm that uh, through an interface once is used in DDA and once in DIA data <clears throat> okay, so in here you just see some examples that it's working. So it's just applied for triple silic uh, on Timstof and on Orbitrap uh, data. So that's kind of, that you kind of see expected ratio distributions for this again three, um, yeah, three different amounts uh, like put exactly together that you get some sort of expected ratio. So uh, as these um, exactly as these um, benchmark data sets are always working basically. And uh, so at the, mo at the moment, we're actually still working on uh, the case where you have um, terminal labels. So in Silec, you don't have terminal labels, but you have amino acid labels. But then for other techniques, you also use terminal labels, like for example, Amtrak uses N-terminal um, labels um, to, uh, to um, to, I mean, not only N-terminal, but N-terminal and also Lysin, basically, for example, in this example. Um, and there's there's a small bug that still needs to be fixed. And so that will be fixed in version 2.5. And then you will also be able to use labelings that also uh, label the N-terminals, like, for example, M-track and um, Dimeso also, I guess, also would actually label the um, N-terminal of... Uh, the N-terminus of uh, peptides. And um, of course, it has a little bit of consequences to which fragments you can, act. so it, it's all, you can always use the precursor signals for quantifying here, but uh, we also want to use the fragment data. So we will do hybrid quantification using both the MS1 and the MSMS data. And then it depends a little bit on the labeling, which of the fragments you can exactly use, right? So because for example, in uh, 
in Silec, you would actually distinguish every all the series that are coming from the C terminus because there you would have either like a light or a medium or a heavy lysin or arginine. So both both of them would be different uh, in the in the three labeling states, which means all the ions that are coming from the C terminus series you can actually use because they are not they are distinct between the three samples basically, right? Um, well, then if you, for example, look at Amtrak, then, and let's say you do trips in digestion, then if you look at the situation at the C terminus, then you can have a lysine there, but you can also have an arginine there. And if it's a lysine, then you have actually separate uh, series ions from um, from the C terminus, right? Because you, if you have the lysine there, then there are three different versions of the lysine, but if you have an argin in there, it's actually not labeled. So then, and then you would actually get the same fragments for the three different samples. So that's not good because then these have no information regarding the quantification, separate quantification of the three different samples. Why for the N-terminus, you always have a label on the N-terminus. So that, that means all the n terminus like the Bs from the N-terminus, um, you can always use then for quantification, right? So that one has to think a little bit about when one is doing this, but this actually um, detected automatically by Max1. So basically from the settings, like how exactly the labeling works and what, what the protease is, it actually detects automatically which ions like the B or the Y or both or whatever can be used <clears throat> for the peptides <clears throat> for the quantification. Okay, so then, yeah, so the um, PTM localization score we're working on, so we, we call it the uh, Max Topos. And uh, so, so the idea here is that we can actually take over as much as possible from the DDA <clears throat> localization score in Andromeda. Um, so basically, we um, basically um, extract all of the like 3D peaks that are overlapping with a certain spectrum in all of the localization states, right? So basically we look at, okay, which um, which peaks and in, in particular the um, site determining peaks would you actually get from a certain peptide in different localizations of the PTM and which of them do we find in the DIA data? And then we, based on that, we calculate the localization as we did it also in um, Andromeda. And you will get then the usual phosphor STY side table, for example, so exactly the same as you would also get from uh, uh, from DDA data. And yeah, so first experiments look quite promising. So then we actually made a fractionate D D DDA library here and um, some DI samples. And uh, that was again all HFX and um, we actually do see more sites um, from the DI samples than we see from the DDA samples. Um, but I would say that's also work in progress. So we're still kind of optimizing the uh, procedure, how to calculate the localization score. And there will also be an update coming in the post um, max quant uh, um, version. So, so one of the improvements will be that one uses more about this correlative information between fragment peaks um, in in the data and also actually that goes back to one of the questions that one actually could use multiple um, like ratios from uh, from different um, from from different fragments and do some kind of max LFQ calculation here not on the protein level but actually on the site level or on the peptide level so so that's actually exactly the idea that we have how the um, the phosphocyte quantification can actually become more accurate in um, DIA than it is in DDA, surprisingly. Okay, so then um, something about large data sets. So here, this is an example of a plasma proteome data set that we're um, doing together with the, with the lab at the University Hospital in Munich. And uh, so this is like human plasma samples. Um, was actually Max Quant version two for one still, so that might be a bit better in two for two already. And so these were um, these were three hundred about three hundred fifty samples 
um, that uh, for which we had, um, yeah, which were measured in this cohort, basically. And um, so that's something one can easily uh, process with, uh, so that's library free, of course. So we just take the human in silico library, basically from Uniprot. And um, so the total running time is actually three days for, for the data set with, um, yeah, 350 samples and uh, with, yeah, relatively moderate uh, uh, standard um, computer hardware. So you, you can actually go to large cohorts or large data sets uh, with the um, max CIA. So that's absolutely um, no problem. And um, so then we always look at these uh, pie charts here where we see, okay, which step in max one is currently actually using most of the time. And that's actually always changing because then as soon as we see, okay, oh, this red pie piece is really big. So we should do something about it. And then we do something about it. And then two weeks later, the pie chart looks completely different because the red piece is gone or much smaller than it than it is before. And that's actually at the moment, DIA library search three. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Uh, so that's the part of the workflow that takes longest. And then obviously that's where we spend our efforts on to um, make this faster than it is at the moment. So that will also be the case then hopefully in the post um, um, summer school version of Max Quant. So then, yeah, a little bit, I uh, cannot really show much of the results because, uh, yeah, it's also proprietary data of the colleagues there that there were, um, and even patient data. So I really should not show this, the results of this. But what, what I can show is that uh, what is the improvement in terms of numbers of proteins that we quantify um, compared to the very first, um, very first max CIA version that, that they were using there. So number of uh, plasma proteins that we find uh, is actually 1,500 in, uh, uh, in the, the two, uh, 241 version like the newer version that they were using. And actually with the first version, they were only getting 570. So it's, it's a pretty good number, uh, 2,500 uh, proteins quantified. And whole blood, it's then um, for more than 4,000. Um, and so this is all protein groups that, that are found in all of the samples together, basically, right? So now if you do stringent uh, valid value filtering, so now you say, I only re uh, retain those protein groups that are showing up in at least 70% of samples, that's pretty stringent uh, um, filtering, uh, then you still are left with uh, se more than 700 uh, plasma proteins. And it used to be 240 in the, in the very old version. So you see actually like a threefold uh, increase in terms of numbers of um, plasma proteins that, that we can quantify. Uh, and actually already with the old version, like if one does the bioinformatics and cluster and, and you name it and correlation with clinical parameters, you already get pretty nice results with, which I cannot show at the moment. Um, but so this, this is all looking very good and can only become better with the, the newer Max one versions basically. So yeah, so that's um, just a reminder. So this batch processing, so this is something that's always happening in the background anyway, if you run Max one now, that's always trying to run 10 samples at a time and then delete the intermediate results. But you could also do this like in, in completely independent Max one run. So you could make like one Max one run with 100 samples now or on this uh, server here, and then you make another 100 on this Amazon instance, and you make another 100 here and there and there. So whenever you have 100 together, you run one max one. And so it's doing the heavy lifting. And then you could put, can put all of these together and make like one quantification over all of these samples. So once you have 10,000 or whatever, then you can then quantify all of them together. So that, that of course, increases the scalability of the whole process a lot that you can do this also do in batches now. Right, and then so one uh, final thing. So we will hear about that uh, from uh, Daniela in her talk on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, sometime this week. And also in uh, uh, Kitty Sharma's uh, keynote talk, I guess it will be uh, mentioned. So we're working on a thing called, um, well, working title Max One Atlas, um, where we can actually integrate uh, 
pro quantitative proteomics data from many sources and from very heterogeneous sources. You can actually see here, so this is integrating LFQ DDA with TMT, uh, with MS1 multiplex DDA, with LFQ DIA, with multiplex DIA. So you can integrate all of these and you actually get uh, quite nice quanti quantification results as you basically get this huge uh, matrix with protein concentrations out um, which you, which are really quantitatively comparable to each other. So you will see that later. So that, I mean, that that's really working. It might, might look a bit surprising in the beginning, but you actually do get, so if you do all of this, and this can be now really 100,000 samples. I mean, it could be everything you find in the pride repository, plus the in-house samples that you generate yourself, you put them all together. So that can easily be 100,000 samples or something, and you will get concentration profiles over all of these. And that's including like at the extremes, TMT and multiplex DIA. So you could actually combine these, which might also be a nice way of uh, of putting single cell proteomics data together, right? So I mean, so that's what, and it's actually computationally very cheap because it's just using the um, already um, computed max quant outputs and puts them together. So, you, so this is not like a reprocessor platform. It doesn't mean you have to reprocess all of the data together in MaxQuant, but it's just stitching together um, the outputs of um, individual MaxQuant projects, basically, right? And uh, so we will see later that this is actually clustering based on, bio on biology and not on, like, it was it measured with TMT or with uh, multiplex DIA or in this lab or in that lab or so that it actually surprised ourselves a little bit how well this is working, but it is actually working. So, so that just as an aside, we'll see much more about this. Um, but of course, you can also then put the DIA to data, first of all, together with each other, but also together with the DDA data and even TMT, if you so like uh, Nikolai could put together his uh, scope MS data with his um, flex DA data or something like this. So, okay, so that's just an outlook um, that will hopefully be come out uh, later this year. So we're working on the publication. Um, and um, so just to remind you what will be again in this 2.5.0 version, the so-called post summer school version. Most importantly, probably everyone likes this on the fly library prediction. So it's just predicted in max one from the faster file. Uh, then we're still working on the flex DIA for terminal labels like the Amtrak. So, but I think we spotted some bug there. So that will be um, definitely in the 2.5.0 version. Then improved phosphocyte localization score. And last but not least, the support for a, a Thermo Fisher Astral data. 